Alright, hi guys. Uh, I'm sorry, this is like my fifth take. I keep having issues with the cat. Um, cat's also sort of the reason I'm out here instead of in my office. Um, but I'm not gonna go into detail. Uh, so, uh, I'm here to talk about A Short History of Nearly Everything by Bill Bryson. Um, it's published in 2003. It's pretty famous. Um, you know, Bill Bryson is a journalist, and this was his attempt to write, uh, uh, you know, about several of the major fields of science uh, for a general audience. And um, so he talks about, you know, cosmology, physics, uh, astronomy, um, biology, chemistry, earth science, you know, the really big major branches of quote-unquote hard science. Um, and, um, you know, it's sort of a given that you're going to learn a lot from this book. I certainly learned a lot that I didn't know. I also learned some other things that I already did know, um, which I guess is a testament to the fact that I actually had a, de a decent high school education. But, um, uh, you know, things like, things I didn't know, like, that if you tried to go to the edge of the universe, you would just kind of end up back where you began because apparently, because it's kind of like trying to go to the edge of the earth. Um, or things like, uh, things that I definitely never knew, like, like, how hard it is to, for a carcass to become a fossil. You know, it has to be kind of in a dry climate, it has to, um, be in a good, ideal spot, has to not be, uh, torn apart by scavengers, um, and sort of things like that. It has to be right, uh, the, around the right type of, uh, sediments, and, you know, so you're gonna learn a lot from this book, um, uh, and I'm gonna say that it's so, sort of obvious because this book is pretty famous, um, but uh, I am gonna talk about something that I find a bit more interesting from it and something that I feel a bit more qualified to talk about. Um, and it's kind of what insights this has for science in general. And uh, science as a process. Now, when I first, when I started my experimental psychology class that I took as an undergraduate, the professor on the first day kind of told us about how we probably think, a lot of people probably think they know a lot about science, but probably really don't because science is often taught as though it's a body of knowledge and instead of as a method of acquiring knowledge. And so, you know, it would be a mistake to say that, um, you know, cosmology is a science because it uses a scientific process. Learning that the universe that you can't get to the edge of the universe, that's not science, that's a sort of piece of, uh, that's sort of something that science has, uh, been able to sort of, um, suggest to us. Um, so, I just want to talk about science and sort of misconceptions about science. So there's this idea that science is black and white, you know, all the questions are right or wrong, either the data supports or doesn't support your hypothesis, and that scientists are these, um, Know, kind of robotic, objective viewers of this data, um, and uh, and that, and I also want to talk about this uh, little. I guess you could call it a bit of a parable that might be getting it, giving it too much credit, but it's it, it was a meme. I don't know if you'd call it a meme either, but anyway, one of those internet things that's like a picture, and um, it's it said something to the effect of philosophy is searching for a black cat in the dark. Um, metaphysics is searching for a black cat in the dark when the black cat doesn't exist. Theology is like searching for a black cat in the dark when the cat doesn't exist and then claiming that you found the cat. And science is searching for a black cat in the dark with a flashlight. Now, I think that does an injustice to those other fields that it mentions, but I wanted to comment on this when I first saw it. I didn't because internet comments. <laughs> um, but I wanted to say, like, as a scientist, as a person who is going to studying to become a scientist, I am offended by this. Um, well, offended has bad connotations these days, but I am, like, upset with this. I, I, you know, this isn't accurate. You know, science does not... Scientists do not have a flashlight that tells them things. So all scientists can do is come up with the best conclusions they can on the basis of the data. All they can do is really suggest things. They can't, science can never give you certain knowledge, um, which is kind of this idea that science is based on this like logical fallacy, which I'm not gonna get into, that's sort of 
more advanced kind of philosophy of science that um, I'm not as qualified to talk about. But, um, but you know, I think in this book you get a sense of how both you get to wonder at how much we've how far we've come, but you also get a sense of how difficult it was to get where we are because in many ways humans are actually pretty bad at science. <laughs> um, like more than half of the sort of big breakthroughs in science, sort of the big, like the theory of relativity of Einstein or um, plate tectonics, uh, that idea. At first they were at best ignored, at worst derided as sort of crackpot or something, even in the face of overwhelming evidence. So you just get a sense of how scientists can be just as dogmatic as, you know, anyone, I guess. Um, so, yeah, and and also biases come into in the interpretation of data. In the last chapter about, uh, about the search for uh, the evolution of humans, the investigation to how humans evolved, there is, it's, Bill Bryson emphasizes at one point how a lot of these scientists would, each scientist sort of has their own theory about where humans came from. Um, it was sort of this multi-regional theory where um, Homo erectus came out of Africa, or not even Homo erectus, but like some proto-human that is kind of vaguely not defined, um, came out of Africa and that any any hominid we found who's a sort of supposed species is really just a transition phase from that proto-human to us. And like, so like basically that Neanderthal doesn't exist and things like that. Um, and there are other theories that there was like a different species in Asia and different species in Europe and Africa. And like, and he talks about how a lot of these researchers would kind of look at all the data and just kind of interpret it the way they wanted to. Um, how if you gave the same data set to a different scientist, they would interpret it differently. And I, I can kind of attest to this in psychology too. Um, I, I took a course last semester on uh, what's called lifespan development, which isn't quite developmental psychology because developmental psychology is usually sort of about um, development from childhood to adulthood, but lifespan development is from sort of birth to death, so like it also looks at old age and things like that. But um, there were two, there are these two competing researchers, um, uh, Bronfenbrenner, Yuri Bronfenbrenner and uh, Sandra Scar, and they both looked at the same data and interpreted it differently. Scott, Sandra Scar, uh, who by the way uh, is my dinosaur's namesake, um, looked at the data and said, well, basically, parenting practices don't matter. Basically, genes determine where you go in life, um, provided that the parenting is beyond a threshold of uh, quality. You know, if the parenting is particularly bad, then that'll affect it. But basically, she, Sandra Scarth said, if the parenting is sort of a good, at some base threshold, then the genetics then the genes are what are going to determine how a kid develops. But Bronfenbrenner um, was all about the different envi different environmental factors that affect the way kids develop. You know, whether a parent is absent or um, or uh, where they grew up and uh, things like that. And they both looked at the same data and came to those completely opposite conclusions. So there is this ambiguity in science, even in physics. Um, even in physics, uh, he's or in astronomy, I guess. But um, hard sciences. And I was just looking back in the book and uh, there's this example of of looking at stars and seeing how far away they are. Because all stars that we see in the sky are moving away from us, or the galaxies at least are moving away from us. And you look at them and you want to determine um, how far away they are. And um, the problem is there's a lot of room in, for interpretation there. There's, there's you know, you look at the brightness of the star, of the galaxy or star, to determine how far away it is. But the thing is, it's like, you, you can't always tell, you can't always tell if um, it is a very, very bright star that's super far away, or whether it's a duller star that's closer. And uh, there's just, there's just a lot of variables that um, different people will interpret differently. And um, so here, even in a hard science, uh, you know, there's room for interpretation. So anyone who would come on and say, well, psychology isn't a real science, then that was that was why I included that example. Um, so, yeah, uh, this is, you know, kind of a testament to the imperfection of science. I mean, 
what th there you also learn there are also a lot of things we're never going to know like whether it's because our tiny human brains can't comprehend what goes on in sub with some subatomic particles or if it's because uh of how incomplete the fossil record is um and we may never know where humans how humans really evolved just because there's just because there's not enough fossil evidence um which is kind of sad but it's just kind of the way the world is um and uh, you see the instances in which, you know, the personalities of humans have prevented the advance of science. How, you know, for years there was this theory in the, in the study of, uh, in earth science or, or geology. Um, the scientists were so desperate to, to not to believe in plate tectonics that they came up with this land bridge theory whereby any animals, like, because there were all these animals that would be like a species of horse that they found both in like Florida and in, um, it was maybe in like uh, England, I'm, I'm not sure. But anyway, animals you they, they were finding in different places, completely opposite sides of the world. And, you know, they needed the theory to explain this. And people were so against the idea that plate tectonics exist that they came up with this, bri this land bridge theory whereby there were all these land bridges just everywhere. And you're just like, okay, but like, this is wacko, like, there's a much simpler explanation here, but the best minds in the world thought it. So, anyway, um, this is, uh, I, th I think that that is what I found most interesting to see in here, is just that examination of science as a process and the way that human personalities, whether it's, whether for good or for ill, can play a part, and how bad we still kind of are at science, um, which kind of makes the the fact that we've come so far even even more <laughs> even better uh, even more worthy of celebration. Um, so yeah, for that reason, I, I think Bill Bryson really uh, gives a good portrait of that, and for that reason, I think that this is a good read. Um, anyway, uh, I've had fun doing this review uh, because talking about science is kind of my jam. Um, so. Anyway, I think, I think that's what I'm going to say. So I would love to hear anyone's thoughts in the comments if you've read this book. Um, and yeah, so thank you for watching. Goodbye.